Let's open up our manuals, if you would, to the first session, which is called The Unstoppable Gospel. Let me start by asking you a question. What words or feelings come to mind when you think about doing evangelism? You can just take a minute and jot down your answers right there. Well, honestly, the first word is fear, because it's a little bit scary. Care, because I know that the people are lost. Fear is probably one of them. Teaching, preaching. Um, selflessness, initiative, and God-centeredness. Uh, sharing other people about Christ and what God has done in my life. Uh, grace, that God gives grace uh, every time you go out. Fear, and, um, and yet also... Um, wanting it to be done. I know probably the biggest answer for most of us is fear. Fear definitely tops the list. Uh, you might have put guilt or even anxiety. Now, maybe you wish that your answers were more faith-filled declarations, but if you're honest, you probably wrote down some things that did express fear or even anxiety. If that's you, you're not alone. But God has given us a desire. He's placed his spirit in us and given us a desire to reach men and women with the gospel. Yet, we also have an ironic aversion to it as well. The good news is that God promises to seek to help us as we grow in this important area of evangelism. So what I'd like to do in this first session is consider three biblical motivations that can help to strengthen and embolden us in the adventure of evangelism. And the first one is the unstoppable gospel. You'll see that on the top of page 8. It says evangelism exists because God designed men and women to bring him glory. I like how John Piper says it. He says evangelism exists because worship does not. God has created men and women to worship him, and it's our desire that there would be more worshipers to give him glory. See, God is passionate about his glory, and he's guaranteed that he will rescue sinners so that they too can delight in his goodness and his grace. He has chosen to redeem a people through the gospel, the victorious work of Jesus' death on the cross. Now, we see in Scripture that the gospel is more than just a message. It's more than just words. It's more than just facts. In Romans chapter 1, it says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. It's power. It's actually a dynamic, unstoppable force that goes forth to accomplish God's will. It's God on the move. I love this quote here by Robert Mounts. He says, much religious discourse is little more than words and ideas about religious subjects. Not so the gospel. The gospel is God at work. And then you'll see that verse there in Colossians 1. It says, all over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. I, lo I love that verse. You see what he's saying there? The gospel is bearing fruit. It is growing. It's expanding. The gospel is on the move. And it has been on the move since the day you first heard it and it had its effect in your life. And now it's growing beyond you and having its effect in the lives of others. Understanding and having confidence in the gospel is really key to our success in evangelism. And it's not just enough to understand the gospel. We have to have confidence in the gospel. We have to believe in the power of this message to accomplish that all God has designed for it. If we don't view the gospel as strong and dynamic, what will happen is we'll tend to lean on our own man-made ideas or techniques instead of the gospel. But the gospel is stronger than we think. Listen to this quote by D.L. Moody. He said, the gospel is like a lion. All the preacher has to do is to open the door of the cage and get out of the way. And that's a great description. All we have to do is open the door of the cage and let the gospel loose. It's like a lion that is ready to tear out and to accomplish all that God's designed for it to do. Our confidence in sharing the gospel can't be rooted in the latest evangelistic te technique or a perfect response or even a clever Christian t-shirt. 
It's found in the power of the gospel. The gospel is breaking forth. It is going out, and God is accomplishing his will. And we get to join him in this marvelous, unstoppable plan. So that's our first motivation, the unstoppable gospel. The second is the Spirit's power. Fortunately, God doesn't expect us to just muster up our own strength and courage to proclaim the gospel. He promises to give us power to do this work. And we see this wonderfully in the book of Acts. You know, all throughout Acts, the disciples, whenever they pray, it seems like God's Spirit comes upon them. And when the Spirit comes and fills them, they're given boldness. They're given power to proclaim the good news. And so we see this direct correspondence between the filling of the Spirit and boldness in evangelism. Look at the verse in your manuals there, Acts 4.31. It says, And when they had prayed, when the disciples had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Do you see the connection there? Do you see how the Spirit of God gives us boldness to overcome our fears and declare the gospel? A funny story about this. When I was in college, we used to have these prayer meetings on Tuesday night, we called them TNT, Tuesday Night Titans. It was dynamite, which is kind of cheesy. But um, so anyway, we had these prayer meetings. They were great prayer meetings, and we were passionate and praying for things. And I remember one prayer meeting, we were praying for the lost and praying for unsaved people on our campus, and we were just crying out that God would use us and that he would save people. And so one of my friends uh, his name was Dion. He was a football player for our college. He's a big, strong, aggressive guy. And we were praying there in the student union building. And so we're praying for the loss. And all of a sudden, Dion jumps out and runs out of the room. And I thought, what is he doing? So I better go chase him. So I ran after him. He charges down the hall, and he barges into this chess tournament. So there's probably about nine or ten different games of chess going on. The, the school chess club is you know, sponsoring this tournament. He barges into this chess tournament and he says, listen up, I want to tell you all about the gospel. And he starts to try to preach. And these people, seriously, they looked at him like he had 10 heads. So I just kind of went in there. I'm like, I'm so sorry. He didn't take his medication and got hit on the head with a large office object. Let me just get him out of here. So I just pulled him out of there. I'm like, Dion, what were you doing? What are you thinking? And he said, he said, well, I just got tired of praying. I got tired of praying. I thought, we got to do something about this. And as I thought about that, I thought, yeah, you know, there's something good in that. And there's something that we see in Acts. When we're filled with the Spirit, when the Spirit of God comes, we pray and we experience His Spirit, there's a boldness to go and act, to go and reach out with the gospel. How often would you say you ask God to fill you with the Spirit? How many people here would say you always ask God to fill you with His Spirit? Just go ahead and raise your hand. How about sometimes you ask God to fill you with the Spirit? Okay, most of you. How about you never, almost never, ask God to fill you with the Spirit? Okay, excellent. Well, attempting evangelism without the Spirit's power is like trying to fly a kite with no wind. You can run around till you're blue in the face, but it's just not going to get up off the ground. We need to ask God to fill us with His Spirit, and God is so willing, and He will graciously fill us and give us boldness for the task of evangelism. Now, after asking God to fill us, we also need to turn and pray for the lost. We need to intercede for them. And intercession not only expresses our dependence on God, that we need God in this task, but it rightly recognizes God's sovereignty, that God is sovereign in salvation. A great prayer for evangelism is modeled for us in Colossians chapter 4. In verse 3, it says, at the same time, pray also for us, that God may open to us a door for the word. Isn't that a great phrase? That God may open a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. That word for declare there is proclaim, that we might proclaim the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Pray that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. This is a great prayer for evangelism. There's a couple things you can consider praying for. First, pray that God would open a door for the word. That's a great thing to pray on your way out of the house. Say, God, open a door for your word today. Pray also that God would give you wisdom in how to pursue and relate to unbelievers, and also for boldness to clearly and graciously declare the mystery of Christ. 
So that's our second motivation, the Spirit's power. The next one is the Great Commission. And many of you may be familiar with this. In Matthew 28, it says, Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. There's a lot of things that we can draw from the Great Commission. But one thing I wanted to point out is that there is clearly a transfer of authority from Jesus to the disciples and then from the disciples to the church. In Luke chapter 9 and Luke chapter 10, we see that Jesus is commissioning both the 12 and then the 72 to go out and proclaim the gospel and heal the sick. Now, prior to that, Jesus was the one that was going out. He was the one that was going to the different towns throughout Israel, and he was proclaiming the gospel and healing the sick. And in Luke 9 and 10, we see a shift. Now his followers are going out. They're the ones that are preaching the gospel and healing the sick. There's been a transfer of authority. He's passed the baton to his followers. And we see that here in the Great Commission. We see that he has been given all authority. Why does it say that? Why does it say all authority has been given to me? I think it implies that he is then giving us his authority. And we have the authority of Christ to be able to go forth with the good news, with the gospel. One other thing that we can see here is that not only does he call us to go forth with his authority, he's right there with us. I love how it says at the end, he says, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. He promises that as we go forth and take even small steps in the area of evangelism, that he is right there with us to the very end of the age, and that's good news. Now, this raises a question. If we've been given this commission, we've been given authority to declare this message. The authority of God has been given to us to declare this. And we have the power of the Holy Spirit himself living inside of us and giving us boldness. And our message is the unstoppable gospel, which is dynamic and powerful and goes forth to accomplish his will. Then what's stopping us? Why don't we seem to be doing evangelism? Why is evangelism kind of right up there with going to the dentist as things you don't want to do until you put it off as long as you can? Why do we lack confidence in the gospel? Well, let me ask you another question. You'll see this on the top of page 12. It says, what are some common obstacles that keep you from sharing the gospel? Go ahead and take a minute and just jot down your answers. What are some common obstacles that keep you from sharing the gospel? Fear of looking uh, like a fool. If I don't feel worthy of, uh, you know, I'm doing wrong all the time, and I just don't feel worthy inside myself, and I'd be like a hypocrite. Unbelief that God's not going to work. I think it's fear. You don't know if people will receive it. Time and busyness. Well, the first one would be fear, fear of man. Probably I have too big of an image of myself, and I'm afraid that someone's going to shoot me down. You might have written down inadequacy. I just really don't know how to do this. I don't know what to say. Or maybe busyness. I know that's a big one for me. I can often be so busy. I have no time for this. Or fear of man. Fearing what others might think. Fearing that you might be rejected. Another common obstacle that we already talked about is a lack of confidence in the gospel. And you may have listed others, maybe things that have to do with a lack of training or practical know-how, something that we hope this course will help you with. But before we talk about practicals, we need to look at an obstacle that is much closer to home. At the root of our reluctance to share the gospel is the problem of the heart. When we are saved by trusting in Christ alone and his death on the cross for our sins, when we turn from those sins and we trust him, The Bible says that we are filled with the Holy Spirit. We're given His Holy Spirit. And not only are we forgiven, 
But the sinful nature that has ruled since the fall of Adam and Eve is dethroned in our hearts and replaced by the rule of Christ through the Holy Spirit. But sin doesn't just admit defeat and slink away. The power of sin remains in our hearts as an opposing force to the work of the Spirit. The Bible actually uses language of warfare to describe this war between our old nature and the new nature. You'll see at the top of page 13 in Galatians 5, it says, For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. We're going to feel this battle in evangelism. Everything in our old nature is going to war and fight against our desires to reach out to the lost. We may even prefer going to the dentist. The sinful nature is going to oppose every thought of doing evangelism as soon as it crosses our mind. 17th century theologian and pastor John Owen, he described the flesh as working primarily through our mind, that the sinful nature works by presenting thoughts to our minds, really lies to our minds, and then our affections attach to those thoughts and our will carries it out. So, for instance, I'll give you a, a quick example. Every morning when I wake up, the first thought that hits my mind is snooze, hit snooze, snooze it, snooze it. That's the first thoughts that come into my mind from my sinful nature, from the flesh. And then my affections attach to that. My affections say, yes, oh, snooze would be wonderful. I mean, another nine minutes would just refresh you. You'd probably bounce out of bed and feel wonderful. So, oh, snooze would be great. And so then I kind of agree with that. And then the will carries it out. And eh, eh, my arm lifts up and hits snooze. Okay? So mind, affections, and will. And it works the same way in evangelism. When the sinful nature of flesh wants to stop us in evangelism, it will present thoughts or lies to our mind that the affections will then attach to and the will will carry out. I'll give you a funny example. I have many that I could choose from. A few years ago, I was in line at a McDonald's or I was in the drive-thru and I was coming up on the window and I was having this battle, which I always do when I think about reaching out. I wanted to give this woman a little gospel track that we have. And so I'm thinking, okay, I should give this to her. And all of a sudden, all these thoughts started coming to her. Well, no, maybe you really shouldn't give it to her. There's other people in line. It's probably busy. Maybe someone else has given it to her. You don't really know what to say. What if you do more damage than good? It's probably best if you just kind of tuck this thing away. And so then I was like, okay, I won't do it. And I, I just, you know, my affections attached and my will just took the invite and just kind of put it down on the seat. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to share it pulled up to the window, and it was this older lady, probably in her 70s, and uh, took the money, and we had this exchange, and I just asked her how she was doing, and she said, I'm fine. She asked me how I was doing, and I made this mistake of saying, I'm, I'm better than I deserve, and I'll sometimes say that because I believe it to be true, and it also has helped me evangelistically to get into conversations, but I didn't mean to say it. I didn't try to say it. It was a mistake. It was an accident. It slipped out, <laughs> and so this, uh, this older lady, she says, um, she's better than you deserve, well, where can I get some of that? And I locked up. I was like, oh, no, I wasn't going to share anything. I already put this away. I'm not going to do this. And then I was like, uh, I took the little book. I said, here, you can get some of that right here. And I kind of threw it into it, hit the gas, <laughs> and just sped away. And so I, <laughs> I mean, think about this. It's like a little old lady. I'm scared to death. Well, what is that? That is, it's the flesh. That's the sinful nature. And the sinful nature is going to oppose us. Listen, this is really important. Evangelism is not about getting so much practice that you no longer have any fears. It's not like you're going to get so much experience and practice that, okay, all fear disappears. This is easy. It's fun. It's natural. That has not been my experience. Over the last 16 or 17 years of doing evangelism, I have met with resistance every time I go to share the gospel. Or every time I even go to just reach out to somebody, I feel resistance. The flesh brings reasons to my mind why I shouldn't do it. And so one of the keys in evangelism is not just trying to get so much practice and I know everything to say that I'm no longer fearful. It's learning to overcome those fears and doing it anyway. That is one of the keys I've learned over the last 16 or 17 years. And that's what I've become experienced at, learning to say, oh, that's the flesh. It's my sinful nature. I see those things. It's still worth it. It's worth this risk, and I'm going to do it anyway. That's a key in evangelism is learning to overcome those fears. Which thoughts have you had when seeking to evangelize? 
and you can check the ones that you've had. I'm no good at answering questions. Or I shared the gospel with him last year. I don't want to turn her off. I'll just keep quiet. Or he looks like he's having a bad decade. (laughs) Or she already knows what I believe. We could have put a lot more down as well. I've had all those thoughts and thousands of others. The bad news is that the flesh does keep many people from sharing the glorious good news. But the good news is that the flesh does not need to keep us from sharing the glorious gospel. As we respond to the work and leading of the Spirit, God will give us grace to overcome the lies of the enemy and to overcome the flesh, and he'll use the truth of his word to do that. To do evangelism is a battle, but it's a battle within, a battle that God, by his Spirit, is empowering us to win. Now that we've established the flesh as our primary source of opposition and wrong thinking, let's move on to examine three common misconceptions that the flesh can throw at us. We'll see a misconception of a role, misconception of the loss, and misconception of eternity. So turn to page 14 at the top. It says, a misconception of our role. One of the first snags in evangelism is understanding our job description. What are we signing up for? What are we supposed to do? You know, a lot of people think we have to kind of, you know, go into a phone booth, put a super evangelist cape on, and (laughs) you know, come out debating like a speeding bullet or confronting more powerfully than a locomotive, converting in a single bound. But that's just not, that's just not the case. That's not what we're supposed to do. In order to understand our role, we must first understand our goal. How would you define the goal of evangelism? Is it to lead someone through the sinner's prayer? Is it sharing your testimony? Inviting a friend to church? performing random acts of kindness, converting others to Christ, or proclaiming the gospel and leaving the results to God. That's right. It's the last one. Proclaiming the gospel and leaving the results to God. This is our definition of evangelism. This next sentence is very important. Our job is to faithfully proclaim the gospel and to leave the results to God. That's what we're called to do to faithfully proclaim this good news and leave the results to God. And Scripture makes it clear that God alone saves. It's not our job to save anyone. God is sovereign in salvation. And he has sovereignly prepared people to both hear and respond to the gospel. That's his job. Listen to this quote by J.I. Packer. He says, So far from making evangelism pointless... The sovereignty of God and grace is the one thing that prevents evangelism from being pointless, for it creates the possibility, indeed the certainty, that evangelism will be fruitful. Apart from it, there is not even a possibility of evangelism being fruitful. Were it not for the sovereign grace of God, evangelism would be the most futile and useless enterprise that the world has ever seen, and there would be no more complete waste of time under the sun than to preach the Christian gospel." God is the one who guarantees success. Methods and strategies are helpful, but they are ultimately not necessary. We simply need to proclaim the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. The flesh, the flesh wants us to worry about how someone will respond or try to control their response. But that's not what God calls us to worry about. He simply calls us to share this good news. And you know what the truth is? If you've shared with somebody, if you've shared this message, even if they've gotten angry or if they've gotten hostile or they haven't received it, you have not failed. You've already succeeded. So that's the first misconception, a misconception of our role. The second misconception is a misconception of the loss. You know, fear is an odd thing. Fear tends to exaggerate reality. It makes us uh, see a monster in every shadow. And it also tends to make us pessimistic and suspicious of others. In the same way, the flesh can tempt us to fear when it comes to the loss. We can easily view non-Christians as these hostile pagans who are ready to publicly chastise us the minute we open our mouths. But the world isn't always as we perceive it. In a recent survey by a man named Tom Rainier in his book, Uh, the unchurched next door. He actually studied thousands of people across the United States, and he categorized them into five different categories. Uh, A U1, an unchurched one, was somebody that was ready to accept Christ and surrender their lives to the Lord. A U5 was somebody that's hostile, open, and antagonistic to the gospel. 
And what he found is that a very small percentage of people are actually U5s. You'll see that in the book. It says 82% of unbelieving men and women in the United States say they would be somewhat likely to attend church if they were invited. Isn't that amazing? Doesn't that seem high? But this is what he found. 82% were somewhat likely to, to come to church if they were invited. And one of the things he said was, well, we need to invite them. We got to get out there and invite. But we can often think, no, nobody wants to come and I better just keep it in my pocket. But this is the facts. He also found that only 5% were openly hostile or antagonistic. Only 5% were those you fought. One out of 20. And I think the problem for us is we can hit one of those folks. Maybe we hit a U5, somebody that's hostile or antagonistic. And then we think, oh, no, I knew we should have done this. This was a bad idea. I should have never taken this proclaimed course. I should have just kept my mouth shut. I'm doing more damage than good. And, and really, only 5%. They're there, but it's only 5%. Often, people are more open to hearing the gospel than we are of telling it. And that's my experience as well. We have a ministry here at the church called a Gospel Outreach, and we go out to share the gospel. We started it a few years ago, and I remember I was going to go out and check it out. I had another person that was leading it, and I thought, well, it'll probably be a good idea for me to go out on one of these gospel outreaches so that I can, you know, see how things are going. You know, I'm kind of the supervisor. I'm over evangelism. It'd be a good idea. Well, as I began to go there, I thought, this isn't going to work. And I started to be bombarded by thoughts. Why are we doing this? Are people really open to this anymore? I mean, we used to do this and it worked, but it's not going to work anymore. And people are kind of hostile to this. What if somebody, you know, locks me up? And uh, all these kind of thoughts. And I thought, well, I better do it. I'm a pastor. You know, I'm in charge of evangelism. I, you know, I'm probably <laughs> obligated. So, so, yeah, there's my motivation for you. So I go on this outreach and we just go out. We go out to the street, to malls and different campuses. And we were just out on the street. And I just began to talk to this guy and just started asking him a few questions. I could not believe how open this guy was to sharing the gospel. I talked to him for half an hour. I was able to talk to him all about the gospel. He was interested. He sat there and talked to me. He was completely open. I thought, okay, well, maybe that was an aberration. So I walked down the street, and I started talking to these other two ladies. Well, they were totally open. They wanted to engage with me. They talked. We talked about different things regarding the gospel and stuff. I couldn't believe it. And that's by, been my experience ever since. See, I think fear tends to exaggerate things. It wants us to think, no, just keep to yourself, be quiet. Everybody's mean and antagonistic, but that's just not true. So the question is this, since people are not openly hostile or antagonistic, is that true for all? Will we never face rejection? Well, unfortunately, that's not true. Many people will still reject us even when we deliver the gospel in an accurate and godly way. But that's in God's hands, not ours. 1 Corinthians 1.18, you'll see it there. It says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. In other words, the message of the cross is foolishness. This is a foolish message. And one of the mistakes that some churches make today is they try to take the foolishness out of the message. They say, well, we can't really talk about sin. We can't really talk about hell. That might offend people. Let's take that out. And they gut the message of the foolishness. When 1 Corinthians 1 tells us that the foolishness is built into the message. It's built right in. This is a foolish message. And people who are perishing will think that it's foolish. But that same message is the power of God. I've shared it so many times with people, and it just seems like foolishness. It doesn't make sense. It's not connected. And then sharing it another time, and all of a sudden, that message is the power of God. Our job is not to take the foolishness out of the message. If we do that, you know what happens? We lose the message, and we lose the power. Then that message has no power. We're called to declare a message that is actually, by design, foolish to those who are unsaved. Also, according to Jesus, personal rejection is not failure, but a reason to rejoice. And I want you to get this. In Matthew 5 there, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven. See, when we're rejected, when we hit one of these U5s, somebody might insult us or reject us or persecute us. We can think, I've totally failed. I can't believe this. I, I should have never said anything. Well, you know what? Jesus' perspective is totally different. You know what he says? If you're willing to take a risk for me, 
If you're willing to step out and proclaim this good news and you're rejected, you haven't failed. You're blessed by me. You are blessed by me. You know what my assessment of it is? It's blessing upon you. Why? Because your reward is in heaven. Because you're not living for this earth, but you're living for another place. And when you do that and you're rejected, that person is actually blessing you. And you're storing that up in heaven, your true home. So the next time you're rejected, don't think, oh, this is terrible. I failed. Think that person has just blessed me. And my reward is is in heaven. Jesus just turns the whole thing upside down and says, you haven't been rejected, you've won, and you've been successful. Let's look at the final misconception. That's a misconception of eternity. It says, most of us like to think where we'll be vacationing next year or the new home that we'll be purchasing, but ironically, few of us think about our eternal home. And many Christians, unfortunately, have quite an undeveloped or even unbiblical understanding of heaven and hell. What's your idea of heaven? Is it floating around on clouds, strumming harps? Is it becoming genderless and personal souls? Is it just lots of time with nothing to do? Or is it everlasting joy in the presence of God and one another? So I think this can really affect our evangelism. Most of us have an unbiblical view of heaven. We literally think of just sitting up on a cloud and strumming a harp. And no offense to the harpists who are among us, but that sounds horribly boring. I mean, is heaven really like that? Is it like, and tonight's harp concert comes from a group from Germany. Hooray, yes. <laughs> is that all it is? No. Heaven is amazing. It's a place that is exploding with joy and wonder and colors and excitement and responsibilities and food and we'll have homes and we'll entertain people and we'll see Jesus face to face. Imagine what the worship will be like. Imagine uh, being free from our sin. Imagine what this place is like. I mean, just thinking about it, even for a, a fraction of a second, makes us long to be there and it motivates us to bring others there. But you know what? If it's a boring place, what are you going to do? You don't care. You don't care about bringing others there. Nobody wants to bring someone to some place that is boring. How about hell, though? Do we ever think about that? Look at the question there. It says, when did you last seriously think about hell? Was it last week? Last month? Last year? Or maybe you never really thought about it much. See, many Christians' view of hell is is deficient simply because they'd rather not think about it. And the effect is to diminish the urgency in reaching out. L.R. Scarborough said, if we could only have a five-minute glimpse into hell, our evangelism would be changed for a lifetime. So I think we can fail to think about heaven and think about it accurately so we don't think about it very much. And then we fail to think about hell biblically. And we just want to push it away from our minds. The flesh wants to keep us from thinking about it. And so we're not thinking about heaven, and we're not thinking about hell. And so what do we think about? We think about earth. We think about right here. And that becomes our focus. And it greatly diminishes our excitement and our enthusiasm for the gospel. We have been created not just for a person, Jesus Christ, but for a place, heaven. And we've been saved from the horrors of hell. How breathtaking to realize that God can use us to deliver an eternal soul from their worst nightmare to their precious Savior. What greater honor is there? And we get to join God in the unstoppable spread of this glorious gospel. Yesterday's looking just like today, always the same. Been meeting familiar lines. I'm hoping to renew my mind with the color of the phrases red and black on ring.